waiting for hi i'm caroline Logan. i'm the co-founder of a mighty blaze and we have something really special today this is one of my favorite writers of all time marissa silver and this particular book the mysteries look at that gorgeous cover this is just an astonishing book about friendship about parenting and of course about all the things that happen in life that we cannot really make sense of so let me introduce Marissa. She's the author of The Mysteries, which I just showed you, Little Nothing, a New York Times Editor's Choice, and winner of the 2017 Ohio Book Award for Fiction, Mary Coyne, a New York Times bestseller, and winner of the Southern California Independent Booksellers Award, and an NPR and BBC Best Book of the Year. Alone with you, The God of War, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction, No Direction Home, and Babes in Paradise, a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and a Los Angeles Times Best Book of the Year. Her short fiction has won the O. Henry Prize and has appeared in The New Yorker, The Holy Grail, The Atlantic, and many other publications, and has been included in the Best American Short Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, as well as other anthologies. In 2018, was awarded the Mary Ellen von der Heiden Fellowship at the Dorothy and Louis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. She received a Guggenheim in 2017, and she teaches at the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson, Warren Wilson College. Marissa, I'm thrilled to have you here with this gorgeous, gorgeous book. Thank you so, so much for being here. So I want to get right into talking about this amazing book. I always want to know, like, what sort of haunts a writer into writing a particular story. I know you've said that part of it came from an accident um, that your father witnessed, which got you thinking about, well, what are the ramifications of that? Um, what about the trauma? And also the whole notion, which I love, is can trauma be passed down like genetic material? And if that's true, what do we do in the face of it? So tell us about starting this amazing book. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny. This novel actually started as a, um, a preamble to a different novel altogether. Oh. Um, and, and it was sort of the, the, er, a story that was meant to set up certain relationships and that would have been referred to in the future, looking back by characters. But then when I dove into this, beginning that novel, suddenly this novel just kind of became, it, it, it became the obvious thing that I should be working on and that it deserved, a, in my mind at least, a novel of its own. So I never ended up writing that other book, but I did turn what was a preamble into a novel. And yes, it was based on um, a story that my father had told me when he was a young boy and he witnessed, I guess we're doing spoiler alerts, I don't know, but uh, he witnessed a, an accident of, of the kind that's outlined in the book. And um, it, it was something that he told me in passing one day and I never heard about it again. It was never, it wasn't one of the family stories that is, you know, baked into the family lore. It was just something that he mm -hmm. mentioned and I and I remembered it, and I think not only was it a function of remembering it that made me want to write this book, but it was a function of um, the mystery around how it affected him because he never spoke of it again. And so I think that you know, in in um, in the absence of having any more facts about it or emotional um, facts from him, I created it. That's that's extraordinary. That's extraordinary because I know those kinds of things they reverberate. It's almost like you're putting a stone in a pool and the ripples come out. Um, I also wanted to talk about the time period you use, which I loved, and I was wondering if you chose it because this, you know, the book is so much about mysteries, time and place, and the '70s were so radically different from the 60s where you know Woodstock became Altima and the peace and love became the Manson movement and all that led to the greedy money making people of the 80s. Was setting it in the 70s a deliberate choice or did it just feel right? Um, well, you know, it's funny that you say that because you know, a lot of decisions for me come out of feeling and it's only beyond that that I figure out intellectually why they matter. So, um, I think the primary reason was I was a little girl in that era. And so I think there, I had a lot of, I was a little bit older than these girls in the book, but you know, I think my childhood, the sense memories of my childhood 
um, which was also in that time taking place in the Midwest where the book takes place, um, was something I wanted to draw on. Um, uh, the other thing is that it's, it's a sort of fascinating moment. It was 1973 is when the book is set. And um, not only are we past the, um, you know, kind of flower child, right. hopeful uh, qualities of the 60s, but 73 was a, a particularly um, uh, uncertain time. I mean, not mm -hmm. only was, you know, the Watergate hearings were happening, so there was a sense that the government was absolutely, um, you know, if you didn't believe it before because of the Vietnam War, you certainly believed it now that the government was not trustworthy. Um, the, the Vietnam War was ending. And I think that along with that comes a kind of despair and a sense of um, mm -hmm. inutility on the part of even people who wanted the war to end, that there's sort of a deflation, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, even though obviously people were ready for the war to end as it should have many, many years before. Um, and then there was, um, I think just, and, that, uh, and then the, the other thing was there was a recession in 73, which yeah. I remember really strongly. I mean, I, I remember gas lines and I remember not eating meat and all those sorts of things. And um, so it's kind of a very potent and uncertain time that for me created a very subtle backdrop drop for the uncertainties that the two families in the novel are experiencing um, in, in their marriages as a result of the sort of central tragedy around which the novel revolves um, in terms of um, women sort of trying to figure out in a, in a newly feminist uh, time who they are, what they want. Um, you know, these are, these are young women, they're in their thirties who have been raised at a different time. Um, and when the expectations their mothers taught them were quite different than the ones that the movement is telling them about. And, and right. women, they glommed onto that, you know, absolutely, immediately. And other women, I think, um, less comfortably. So I wanted to explore that too. So it just was this really potent moment in American society that seemed to work quite well for the stories that were being told. It's really interesting because I also remember that even in the radical groups like the Weathermen, the women in those groups, they still had to do the dishes. Yes. <laughs> they still had to do the cleaning. Yeah. And the whole thing about the free love movement was that women were not supposed to say no. <laughs> so, and they did not have the right to say no. So it's, it's interesting when you look back at time from the perspective of the now because things take on very different meaning. I want to ask you about um, the whole notion of friendship. This book is really about the friendship of two little girls, but it's also about their parents and about parenthood. And what I loved so much was that you gave a really realistic por portrait of what these parents think it's going to mean to have kids and what their life is going to be like and what it really means and how it really turns out. And then what do you do about this. And the thing with being a parent is as your kids grow and change, you do too, you can't help but that. So I was wondering if you could talk about that, you know, those changes sure. in relationship to your characters. Yeah, I mean, parenting is something that I, I really, um, have, I've written about a lot in different contexts, um, precisely for the reasons that you mentioned, which is that, you know, it's not, um, it, it's not all honey and, and roses and, you know, it's a complicated, sometimes really charged, sometimes very negative, sometimes super positive experience. Um, and I think that we're burdened by the idea that we're supposed to only feel positively toward it. And right. yet in reality, um, it's, a, it's so complex and, and you have as many feelings of love and passion for your children as you do despair and sometimes frustration and fear. Um, so I, I, I wanted to write about these, um, particularly these, the, uh, these, two couples and the different relationships they have toward their children um, in order to explore the kind of um, ambiguities of parenthood and not just the um, kind of the gloss that we like to put over it. Um, in addition, the children, the two little girls um, are really different personalities, but in, you know, Miggy, the central character in the book is this kind of um, outsized, uh, vibrant, mm -hmm. uncontrollable, willful girl. Um, who's really hard to manage. Um, Ellen is a more dutiful child, but her emotional life is so suppressed that one could worry about that too. Um, and so I wanted to write about how these parents um, confront these, the personalities of their children, which is something that all parents have to do. You know, children right. 
they they come in complicated and they don't stop being complicated. No, they don't. And the thing is, the more complicated your kids are, you sort of reflect, did I did I do something? Or is it for me or is it from my partner or whatever's going on? It's it's always complicated. I, I want to talk about the power shifts when Miggy comes into her own mm -hmm. and all that happens and all how that changes the friendship. Uh, Miggy's sort of wild while Ellen's sort of contained. But what I really wanted to know is how did you get on the head of a seven-year-old so perfectly? I mean, those girls were a lot of the I'm, you know, stuck in, I, 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 I don't, I think that I didn't think so much about whether they were seven. I just treated them like characters, you know? And I gave them, I dignified them with as much complexity and um, kind of sur surprise in terms of behavior and, and language as I would an adult character. I mean, I think children are just, you know, they're not, they're not less formed. They're not less, uh, and uh, complicated, they're they're f so. I think I think rather than worrying so much about is this what a seven year old would think? I mean, I did at certain points, but I mostly just as I would do with any character, got to know them and then was able to write them. The more particular I the more particularly I understood them, the more they could come alive on the page. I want to show again this gorgeous cover because this is sort of the perfect cover. Um, it describes these two girls' different personalities, like perfectly with an image. It's just, it's just absolutely terrific. So mm -hmm. I want to talk about the title of the mysteries and that whole notion of the mysteries of life, and the fact that sometimes we don't get answers to those mysteries, or. If we do get answers, maybe you get an answer to something in your 20s, but that same answer doesn't work for you when you're in your 40s. So first I wanted to know, what do you personally do with your own unanswerable questions? Do you try to write your way to an answer? Or do you just sit with the fact that we can't know everything, that sometimes we just don't know? Um, I think I'm much more interested in not knowing. I think, I think that when, I mean, an answer to something sort of shuts the door, right? And, and it, I mean, not only is it mostly um, incorrect, I mean, two plus two is four, but, you know, for the larger or existential issues, answers are, um, you only find out that they're not sufficient. That's all you end up finding out. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as a writer, I always, um, I don't look to for closure like that. I don't look, I don't think of a novel or a story as being something that should address an answer, a problem or a question or a, right. um, I think of it as something that simply uh, opens it up and that, right. you know, you, you want to leave a book. I think you want, I mean, I want to leave a book having had a kind of a, a deep immersive experience with characters in a world, but also I want to leave it with sort of more questions. You know, I want my brain to be moving forward and in terms of, I mean, like the book might have shifted my angle of view. It may have opened up new ways of looking at things that I thought I had understood. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the central mysteries in the book obviously have to do with life and death and they have to do with war and they have to do with marriages and divorces and, and <laughs> constancy and all those sorts of things, none of which are answerable if they were, you know, we would. I don't know. I think it would be a little more boring. To yeah, be I was, yeah. I always, I always look for what I call the never-ending story at the end of the book, where it's, or, or else you could call a cut before the kiss, where you close the book and you're still wondering. Yeah, oh, I wonder what they're going to do or how things are going to change, and yeah, which leads me to a structural question for you. I've, I've. Um, read things uh, from interviews where you, with you where you've talked about how you write. And what surprised me so much was that you don't outline and you don't structure, um, which is what I do. Um, but I was wondering, so if you don't structure anything, what do you know when you start writing? Is it just an image? <laughs> well, very little. And, and the fact that I don't structure and I don't outline is is mostly because I don't know. I don't start by knowing a whole lot. I mean, with this, I had Miggy in my mind. I had this central event because it was something that I knew from my own family life. Um, and then that's about all I knew. And then I had to figure out who all these people were. And the work, the three years of work of the book was getting to know these people more deeply and more deeply and more deeply. And whenever I ran into a 
problem. It was because I didn't know them well enough. And so, um, which isn't the case with every book I've written. Some have more, you know, kind of mm -hmm. movements and things like that. But this one really is, you know, there's a central event and the rest of it has to yeah. do with um, the behaviors before and after that event that, that allow us to see change and, and a repositioning of people's ideas of who they are and what their lives and what the terms of their lives are. So I, I, I start with a shred. I mean, and, and it's always been that way for me. I start with a, you know, the idea of a, a I don't know, an activity, an action, a, 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 some language. Um, and then I basically crawl my way forward. We were talking earlier <laughs> Dan about, you know, sort of the difficulties of the first draft. And for me, it's a slog. It's like just getting, okay, what next, what next, what next? And whenever I've tried to outline, I mean, it sort of has a corollary, corollary in what we were talking about before in terms of, you know, not knowing. I feel like when I know, then I'm, I'm driving the car toward that and, and I'm not going off on any interesting byways. And so for me, the book doesn't feel as surprising. Um, you know, I kind of want to end my experience writing a book, having written a very different book than what I thought I was going to write. Oh, yeah. Well, that that turns out that way anyway, even if you... Yeah, well, and, and as I said, it's, people who write outlines are no, you know, write brilliant books. It's just not, I can never see it going forward. I can never, I mean, you know, sometimes I wish to God I could. I wish I had a bunch of, you know, note cards up on my wall and I could oh, just... I can't do that. <laughs> 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 so I want to talk about some of your other books. Like you've written a lot about people who are sort of really interesting or outside. Like Little Nothing is about a girl with dwarfism who's stretching to be taller. Barry Coyne was about a depression era photojournalist, Dorothy Lang. And you could say that the mysteries is also about people beyond the norm. So what excites you about a character? What is the one thing that pulls you in that makes you want to focus on that character and think, I want to know who that person is? Um, I, that's a really great question. And I guess the answer is that I, I see them in a certain situation and I think, what were they thinking in that situation? Like I remember when I, Mary Coyne, which is based on the famous photograph, Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange for people who right. don't know. Right. Um, I, of course, had seen that, you know, image um, um, so many times in life because it's, it's pretty ubiquitous, but I, had, I saw it at a museum in an, uh, at the Modern Art in, in New York City, um, right? And, and I looked at the photograph and there was a little card next to it that said that the woman in the photo um, didn't say who, that she was that woman until she was older and sick and needed money for healthcare. And so immediately in my mind, I thought, wow, so what was she thinking all that time? That she was this photo image made famous, made ubiquitous. Um, and yet she didn't claim it. Why? Um, with with little nothing, you know, it, it has a more fable-like quality, but it's a character who's born a dwarf, which is um, in, in sort of the early part of the 20th century in an unnamed place. Right. And her parents are so um, horrified by her physical situation that they try to have her stretched. And then that process begins a sort of series of, of, of transformations in her physical life. Um, and and I guess that all uh, that had to do with um, thinking about what would it be like to know that your form was um, was something that people wanted to change, and which has to do with being a woman to me very much. Yeah, you know? that's so. Right. So, um, so for me, it's people who are in a situation where. Um, it's, it's a charged situation. It need not be, you know, she murdered someone. I mean, that doesn't appeal to me, but it's sort of the more private, um, private senses that you're not, um, you're, you, you haven't claimed yourself. Right. So in, in talking more about story, you're also a really successful filmmaker. I think you won the grand jury prize when you were in your 20s. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to know, I, I have a bunch of questions about that. First, did you start out wanting to be a filmmaker and then a novelist? Which came first? Which do you prefer? Does it take a different brain set for you to switch from one to the other? And how does writing films inform your writing of novels and vice versa? <laughs> so well, a lot of 
easy to answer because I haven't made films for um, 30 years. I, I stopped making films um, in my, you know, after about 10 years of doing it. So I don't switch back and forth and I don't write. Well, for why? why? Why did you stop making films? Um, You're just not interested in them? I think I got to the point, I started out really young in my 20s and I made a bunch of films in my 20s. And I think I came to this moment where I thought, I'm I'm kind of moving really fast on a train, but it's not the right train. Like I, I'm not feeling like I'm getting to tell the stories I wanna tell. Um, you know, film, as you know, as everyone knows, there's a lot of cooks, you know, stirring the broth. Right, right. that's um, right. Stories don't tend to linger on the small things that a fiction can linger on. And they certainly don't um, concern themselves with interiority with consciousness in the same way. Um, and I think I had this very um, strong feeling that I, that's what I wanted artistically, that, 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 so I kind of jumped off the train, put myself into graduate school <laughs> and, and started writing. And I don't go back and forth at all. I mean, I don't have any interest in making films and, and um, I really am focused on writing. So it's not a, a challenge. That's great. So you also teach. Uh, so no. what I want to know is like, what do you love about it and what don't you? Oh, well, there's nothing I don't love about it, actually. I really love it. And I, and I, what I love, you know, when I began to teach, I began not too long ago, about six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. I was worried that it would somehow detract from my practice as a writer because it would, I would be foregrounding intellectually and analytically mm -hmm. stuff that I wanted to keep very, um, much a part of my subconscious, but it's turned out to be quite the opposite and that um, I'll, focusing in a, in a really um, assertive way about um, issues of craft has kind of, it's like I'm in a constant MFA, you know, I'm, I'm reteaching myself all the time. These, 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 in, in the same way that, you know, there are unanswerable questions that, you know, the craft of writing and I'm sure of any art form is myriad and it doesn't, you never know it, you know, you never, you never can say, oh yeah, I, I'm done. I've, I've figured it out. That's how you do it. Um, and I love working with, um, people's material and, and helping them to figure out what it is they want to say, how they want to say it, you know, what, what their voice is. I, um, I don't know. It's to me, it's a great counterpart to writing. It's been really fulfilling. It's also nice, frankly, to, you know, be with human beings. I mean, I'm alone a lot in my room and right. it's really nice to interact with people and to um, help them figure out how, how to, you know, bring their their own uh, concerns to the surface in a, in a sh the shapely way of fiction. Right, yeah, and I'm intensely curious. Do you, um, do, when you're writing a novel, do you show your pages to other people before you present it to your agents? Uh, do you have specific readers that you like to use or do you prefer to just get it down, send it to your agent, hear what your agent says and then work with your editor? I, um, I, I, my, my husband is my reader, uh, for, you know, I mean, from his point of view, maybe for better, or for worse, because he has to read stuff a lot <laughs> and, and, um, somehow manages to be fresh about it. So I show him stuff along the way before I would show it to anybody else. Um, you know, stuff that might be pretty, um, unformed or, um, you know, I don't know, not, not at a point where it could be shown to other people. You know, I usually share work with, um, one or two writer friends, but it's different each book. The person who it is that book. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, and I and I um, and then and then once I have it in hand, I well, I, I've shown my agent work in in kind of chunks, but once I have it in hand, that's when I show it to my editor. Um, I want I want to tell all the people out there listening. If you'd like to ask Marissa a question, just put it in the chat or in the questions, and we will get to them. So I want to ask you: Do you feel like you each novel builds on what you've done before, like that there were specific lessons that you learned in writing your last book that you can apply to your newest book, or do you feel that every book is its own thing? Well, I think that I do have more fluidity with issues of craft. Like I, I can say to myself more and more as I write, I have to think about the structure of this book, or how do I, or how do I think about the structure of the book? But I think every book is its own beast. And and I feel, and I know a lot of writers feel that every time you start something new, you feel like you haven't written a book before because this book's requirements are wholly different. I mean, I don't really want to write the same thing over and over again. I suppose oh, no, that's not fun. I write something in the vein of, you know, Mary Coyne over and over again, and maybe it would become somewhat easier, but that just seemed really 
Yeah, why do it that? Interesting. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, th I think, you know, and, and, and in terms of genres, I don't, you know, I, I don't have a genre that I love or hate or, or, you know, books require their, their own way of telling. And so if you end up writing a book like Little Nothing that ends up kind of having this fabulous fable-like um, gloss over it, that's because that's what was required. It wasn't as though I started out to say, oh, I want to write a book that has a fable-like quality. Um, <laughs> I just found my way into a certain tone and a certain set of circumstances and things happening that, you know, may or may not happen in actual life. Um, so, yeah. So I think every book is its own, which is kind of, it makes it hard, but it makes it exciting because you feel like you're reinventing yourself every single time. Do you ever reread books that you've already published? And if you do, do you ever read them and think, Oh, I wish I had done this instead of that. <laughs> Do you well, for that? that reason, I don't. I, mean, <laughs> I read over some short stories here and there when I've had to like, you know, I don't know, talk about them or, but I've never read my books again. Um, one day maybe, or maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's for other people or my children or whatever. But no, I feel like every book is what I could do then, what I was capable of that at that moment. And, and also how I saw the world at that moment, which, mm -hmm. which changes. I mean, in, um, so I don't, you know, it's, a, it's almost like looking at yourself with like in a snapshot with horrible, you know, 80s hair or something. It's like, that's, <laughs> that's what you think. And, and, and I'm not saying the books, I hope they're not horrible, but they, um, I think I would, if I did reread them, I would, I would have a sort of gentle um, acceptance of them because it would sort of be like, well, that's who I was then. And that's what I could do. And, you know, good for me then. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you feel like when you finished writing the mysteries, did you feel changed? And how well, how did you feel changed by it? Because usually um, you're so used to hearing readers saying, "Oh, I loved your book, Larissa. I was so changed by it. It really helped me." But I'm more interested in what you as the author felt when you were finished and the book was out in the world. That's a really really good question, Caroline. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Exactly right. People experience it for the first time. I mean, I, you know, as you know, you go, you're writing a book, you're going over it and over it and over it so that it doesn't have the same, you know, newness to you. Um, I don't think that I am changed in the sense of having an emotional response to the book that is different for me. Um, but I definitely um, sense certain of my abilities changing, um, expanding, hopefully, um, <laughs> certain of my, uh, cur the way I think about fiction changing. Um, you know, the more books I write, the more I think about, well, what is fiction? What is the purpose of me writing a fiction? And, and that changes sometimes as a result of writing the book. So, so maybe the things that I think change me have, are, surround the book are not so much about the story itself. So I'm going to ask, um, so what to you right now is the purpose of fiction? I mean, what do you think fiction, why do you think we write fiction? Is it for, to get people to empathize in a way that's safer for them to do than if they were reading say a memoir or nonfiction? Um, or is it, you know, or is it solely for the writer to be figuring things out as you're writing it. I mean, what's the connection between your audience and you? Another great question. Hard question. Yeah, I'm asking you things I can't answer. <laughs> well, that's not fair. Um, I think that uh, for me, when I write a fiction, it is the lens through which I'm living my life during that period of time. So, um, when I'm immersed in a story, I'm never not in it, even if I'm not writing. Right. And so it kind of shapes those years of my life. It becomes like the the kind of um, skeleton of those years. Um, and so I think of all the things that are happening in my life during that period of time as somehow in subtle ways informing the thing that I ultimately make of it. I mean, that's kind of abstract. Um, in terms of fiction, um, I think more and more I'm interested, you know, we always, we all say, oh, you know, fiction or art in general, it allows us to, you know, look at the reality of life through this different gloss and, 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 and that's yeah. true. And, right. see, and 
sort of inform, see reality, you know, kind of in this heightened way that allows us then to look back at the real and have a different attitude toward it, which I think is accurate and of, true of all art. Mm -hmm. But I'm also more and more just interested in form and how things are formed and how we shape our experience. And I think the formal aspects of fiction writing um, uh, have a lot of uh, metaphors for me in terms of how we uh, look at memory, how we look at, how we think mm -hmm. about what our life is. You know, we, we um, you know, we live our life chronologically, but we're constantly right. forcing back. We're constantly having yeah. memories. We're constantly kind of circling around. And, and so I think the, the, the writing fiction helps me to encapsulate the experience of consciousness. That's why I write fiction. And, and, I don't, and readers read fiction for different reasons. I mean, you yes, know, do. you're right. To immerse themselves in a fantasy story or some are going to read it because they want to, they see a connection to their own lives in that story. Some of them want to read things that have nothing to do with their, I mean, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of, I don't, I don't, wouldn't sort of dare to say who my readers are or what they should get. I think everybody gets. Everybody gets something different. They yeah. all approach the work in a different way. Um, I also wanted, we were talking a little bit before the interview about what parts of writing you liked the best and what you didn't like. And you were talking about revision. Can you talk about that first now? I love revision. <laughs> I, think, I think first draft stuff is really hard. As I said, for me, it's hard to just face the blank page and get those words down. Um, and then revision is like playtime because even though you're going you're gonna to write more things you haven't created yet, it, you have something there with which to play, you know, and, and, and that is really fun for me. And, and, and so it, it I, and yeah, so that's the part that's really pleasurable to me. The, the first part, getting it onto the blank page is, is rough. It's tough. It's hard. And there's just constant second guessing and wondering if anything's going to, cohere or so it takes a lot of faith it takes a lot of kind of turning off the the uh critical mind and just saying go for it keep going keep going keep going um so that and and not wondering if it's good if it's bad if it's going to work if it's going to sell if it's going to anything right all those things <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty hard. I mean, turning off that part of your brain is rough. It's hard. It's rough. It is rough. I also wanted to know, like, how do you deal with the two different selves of yourself as a writer? There's a self where you're there and you're just writing and you're in that world and you're working. And then there's the you that has to come out when a book is out. And you have to interact with your readers and you have to go out on tour, virtual, real tour. And it's very, very much about the aftermath the marketing and the reviews and everything else. Um, how easy or how difficult is it for you to switch from one to the other? And Well, it's not so difficult to switch because, you know, a book, as you know, is done way before you're out there in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's at least nine to months to a year. So um, I think it's, it's, I just look at it as being very different. I mean, I try not to, I, I you know, the marketing of a book is its own beast. Yeah. Um, doesn't have to do for me with the creative imaginative place that I'm in when I'm writing a book. It's separate. Um, it's incredibly fun to bring a book out into the world and to share it with readers who then have their own experience of it that you could never imagine. Right. I mean, it, you know, I think a book is sort of like writing the book is half of it. The other half is when a person, you know, engages with it. And the full experience of that book from their point of view is when those two things come together. Um, and that's, you know, I, it's exciting. And then it's fun to talk, I mean, you know, the, the virtual or not, it's fun to sort of talk about the book and talk about, you know, how it was made. And, you know, it's such a long private process and it's kind of nice to, to get out there and share it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a very different head. I try not to worry too much about things like, um, you know, the marketing side of it, I mean, I care, obviously, you know, um, but if that's what I care about only, then that's kind of- That's the wrong reason to write, if that's yeah, what you can't, can't. I mean, I'm, maybe people do, um, but I, I find it utterly um, stifling to be, you know, trying to figure out what the market wants at the same time. That yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, I also wanna ask, um, oh, I forgot my question. Oh, it's terrible, I had a really good question, I forgot it. <laughs> well, let me, oh, you know, no, no, I remember, now I remember. Um, so we've had a really crazy year, 
with the pandemic and all of this, and people have been alone a lot. Has has this changed you as a person and as a writer? Do you feel that you need to write about it? Um, because I personally feel like it's not, I don't, I want another 10 years to go by before I figure out how I really feel about it. But how do you feel about it? Well, I don't think I would write about it and certainly not now. Um, I tend not to be a particularly like topical writer. I don't write about what happened in the right. news yesterday. Um, I think that what will inevitably make its way into my fiction and I'm sure in many people's fiction is just a more philosophical um, reaction to the time. You know, how, how, do, how do we think about distance between people? Right. How do we think about connection? How do we, you know, what, what matters? What does suddenly doesn't matter? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what, what have I not missed? You know, um, uh, and, and, and fear, you know, and deal with living with fear. So I think some of the more kind of um, thematic, if for want of a better word, um, uh, ideas that surround what we've all been going through will certainly make its way into my work just because it's a new way. Of, I, it's the way I now think about the world. I mean, new things have been revealed to me. Um, you know, new, new, uh, I'm, no one, I've never had to confront a pandemic. I've never had to be scared of be, being next to another human being in that way, you know? So, so those sorts of things are, um, certainly, I mean, in terms of breathing and, you know, all the things I've, uh, you know, I've never washed my vegetables in the same way. <laughs> and, and, and that's why I know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that those things will definitely make it in. I mean, you know, Fiction, no matter what the story is, no matter how far away it is from something quote unquote topical or relevant, um, has to be an expression of how you see the world at any given moment. Um, Mark, do we have any questions? And while we're waiting for questions, I want to ask you, what's up? Oh, here's a question. Okay, you moved away from screenwriting, but are there things that novelists can learn from screenwriters? What is it about film storytelling that remains compelling for you? That remains compelling for you? That's a, that's a really great question. That's a good question. Um, there's a lot that I... Um, I, I only I, I didn't write that many screenplays. I really directed more, so I, I can't really speak very authoritatively about being a screenwriter. But there's a lot of craft in film that is very applicable to um, to writing, somewhat different. But in terms of, for instance, camera angles, and ca you know, when I think about narrative distance, I mean, this is kind of wonky, but you know, if you're how far away am I? Am I right close to the consciousness of my my character? Am I hovering above and talking about it in an omniscient way? There are camera angles that do the same thing and how a camera moves in a scene. And it can be very useful in terms of thinking about how your voice, your uh, might really? go close to a character and then rise up and then move over and go down into somebody else's, you know, consciousness. Um, editing is absolutely has a lot of bearing, you know, how, what, scenes lie next to each other. What What is the, um, you know, when we, we we write and we're thinking, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's a chronology to scenes, but sometimes it's more abstract. And so the question is, what is the, the join between those two scenes? What happens as a result of putting them together? Right. And certainly in terms of, you know, how time management, I mean, writing is, fiction is about nothing if not time, right? And so, um, you know, how are you managing the passage of time? How are you cutting from one thing to another? How, what are you leaving out? All those sorts of things are true in film too. What's not true obviously is the consciousness of a character. A film character doesn't speak their their thoughts to, for the most part. Um, and one of the great pleasures of fiction is that you can be inside of a person's mind and you can decide whether what that person is telling you is true or not. Um, you can decide if they're deluding themselves or not but you can be there. So uh, you're giving such absolute gems of information here. I'm wondering, did you ever think of, or would you ever like to write a book on writing? Oh, um, you know, not yet. I mean, I, I okay. you know, maybe I'll have a, a, a series of lectures that I've given as a teacher and maybe that'll be something, but um, no, I mean, I, I haven't yet but I sure do love some of them. I mean, talking about time, I think about Joan Silver's book, um, The Art of Time, from the, right. that great series, which is so spectacular. Um, I, there, you know, there's a few writing books that are just amazing. Um, Ali Smith's Artful, which is an incredible book. Right. Um, 
but no, I've never, I've never thought about saying, okay, I'm going to take the next few years and write a book about writing. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have a, oh, that that is in the face, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about what fiction means for you as a writer. What is it that the best works of fiction do for you as a reader? It's another fantastic question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the best, well, for me, uh, since I'm constantly thinking about how books are written and how they're put together, books right. that excite me to read are books that do something interesting with form, not necessarily experimental, but um, when I can see that an author has, you know, used formal um, formal choices to help the story emerge, that's what excites me about form. How can form, not just, you know, is it flashy or stylistically pretty, but how does it tell the story that you're trying to tell? And, and that really excites me. Um, you know, a book that grips my, me by the gut excites me um, in the way that it does for everyone. Um, but I think that I'm probably, um, you know, for better or for worse, I, I, don't, I don't have an ability to read anymore and get completely swept away. I'm always seeing how the writer did it. And oh, now, right. For, for I, I can't not see it. So I guess that's the stuff that excites me now. Um, you know, and, and also just at the level of the sentence, I'm always excited by writers who um, find language that is a surprising way of getting inside an experience that I thought I understood. When they put uh, together two or three words as uh, an, as an association I would never have made before that suddenly kind of explodes okay. that idea that I thought I understood, that's, that's incredible. That's like, that, that's when you stop, or I stop and I read the sentence over and over again. We have time for one more audience question, if we have it. What advice would you give an aspiring author just starting out? Also, if you'd change anything on your path, what would it be? Okay, well, aspiring author just starting out, I would say um, no one is going to believe in you as much as you need to believe in yourself. And no oh, one's going to give you permission to do it. No one's going to give you permission. You know, And the hardest thing to do is to declare, I'm writing, I'm a writer. And you are a writer if you're sitting down to write. I mean, there's no moment where you suddenly go, now I'm a writer. You know, if you're <laughs> hours of a day or hours of a weekend, whatever you have writing, then you're a writer. Um, so I would say, you know, give yourself permission and take yourself seriously. Don't wait for other people to anoint you. I don't remember the second half of that question. What um, would you do differently? Uh, I, yeah, well, what would you do differently in your path? I guess the only thing I would do differently is just try not to second guess myself, you know, but that's just a, you know, I, I do it all the time. I mean, I, most of us do, you know, is this idea any good? Is it going to work? Is it going to, um, it may be taking my own advice. You know, I, I need to, you know, give myself permission. So um, I'm constantly kind of recreating my sense of faith in myself and my, and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and I don't know, is that something I regret? I don't know. I'm, I'm just what it is. This is just completely spectacular. I want to show this gorgeous book again, The Mysteries. Um, everybody out there, you can order it through us on bookshop.org and support your local indies, which is really important. Marissa, I have loved your work for so long, and you have no Thank idea how thrilling to be speaking with you here. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank and you, everyone. All the viewers, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you, everybody. And this will be available on YouTube and also on, um, on uh, Facebook on A Mighty Blaze. And we'll see all of you at another time. And thank you for showing up. Bye-bye. <laughs>